Now you talk about terror. I've been terrorized all my day. Hammer all my day. Hi, I'm Chris Edges. Welcome to Days of Revolt. Today we're going to be discussing the militarization of institutions of higher learning, the way these institutions have been reformed into not only vocational centers, but vocational centers that increasingly serve the interests of the security and surveillance state. With me to discuss this issue is Alexa O'Brien. She researches and writes about the national security state. She co-authored a piece with William Arkin for Vice News into the top militarized universities in America. Welcome. Thank you for having me. It's an honor. So let's look at what you did over this multi-month project, uh, how you conducted your research, uh, what it is you were looking for, and what it is you discovered. So we took a sample of 90,000 educational and work backgrounds um, of members of the intelligence community with top secret clearances and combined that with uh, 51 additional factors related to um, security, academic, and scientific partnerships between institutions of higher education uh, and the national security state, uh, which broadly would be Homeland Security, military intelligence, and law enforcement, as well as um, federal uh, funding for uh, research and development with a national security interest to essentially rank the top 100 most militarized schools in the United States. Uh, we had a difficult time with the term militarized. You know, we, we thought, well, God, you know, this is really about more than just the military or kinetic weapons. Uh, this is about intelligence, this is about cyber warfare, this is about information, law enforcement, and the like, homeland security. Um, but we found that no term really could describe what we were seeing uh, in these schools. So we, we settled on militarized. And one of the things that I found fascinating is that among the very top schools are these for-profit, often online institutions that have catered quite specific to the quite specific needs of the national security apparatus. Yeah, this is something that uh, was very interesting to us too. So 20 of the top 100 schools uh, in our list are essentially uh, predominantly online diploma mills. 12 of those are for-profit colleges. Um, to explain this phenomenon, one has to look at the makeup of the uh, intelligence community, generally speaking. So here you have a breakdown of um, you know, less than 30% is government federal employees. Then you have 54%, the largest cohort, is actually military people with top secret clearances uh, in our sample. And then finally, um, you have 18% uh, is contractors, so federal contractors. Um, in about 2009, um, the uh, post-9-11 GI Bill for veterans and the Department of Defense Tuition Assistance Program really subsidized and um, helped to catalyze an explosion in these for-profit online schools. What kind of numbers, what kind of, you know, costs are we talking about? Well, if you, if you look at the amount of um, uh, funds from the Department of Departments of Veterans Affairs and Defense between 2009 and 2014, you're looking at around $19.5 billion. Half of that is going to these for-profit schools. So then you see that translating into the sample that we have, which represents 6% of the intelligence community with top secret clearances. Okay. Um, essentially, the second uh, you know, rated uh, school for top secret employment in the intelligence community is American Military University. Which is? Which is basically a, a online, solely online school. Um, 
It's part of the American public university system. The name's a little tricky there because it's actually a for-profit, you know, uh, college. Um, and half of its, more than half of its enrollment is military. Um, and schools like American Military University and University of Phoenix, which has gotten a lot of notoriety and, and sort of infamy in the last uh, year because of uh, the DOD kicking them off of bases because of uh, questionable marketing practices to military service members, as well as, uh, you know, an investigation by the Departments of Education and um, Justice into their um, their marketing practices. Again, here you have uh, schools that are populating our national security state from the military to the intelligence community that uh, raise very important questions about um, the integrity of the degrees that these students are leaving these Do schools Do I have with. it correct that in some cases the degree programs have been designed with assistance from, like, Homeland Security? Yes. So after 9-11, the Department of Homeland Security uh, was essentially mandated by Congress to establish an educational program, a curricula for Homeland Security Studies. And there is a lot of controversy over the pedagogy of this particular program um, that has essentially uh, populates 250 schools, uh, many of the schools on our list. So we saw in our uh, investigation the growth of Homeland Security Studies as a discipline. In fact, it's it's one of the larger growth areas as since 9-11. And then also intelligence as a component of law enforcement. So when we look at the academic curricula of the intelligence community in the national security state, we're not seeing a large population of people who are studying uh, cultures or languages or public affairs or world affairs or anything that you would think a person would need to know in order to know about the world. What they're studying essentially are information technology, systems management, business management, criminology, and intelligence and homeland security. I mean, that's what they're studying. In fact, I think one of the most important findings that we discovered that was revealed in our investigation was uh, essentially less than 100 people out of a sample of 90,000. This sample represents great fidelity in, in what it reflects about our national security state and intelligence community. Less than 100 people have degrees in Middle Eastern studies. Further to that, less than 1% identify themselves as Arab linguists. So this whole prevalent common notion that after 9-11, the national security community had a boots on the ground about face and was you know, interested in human intelligence and human um, uh, uh, you know, collection of intelligence as well as uh, language and cultural studies is absolutely false. This research that you did, I think, also has tremendous effect, not just on these, uh, you know, online uh, degree mill for-profit programs, which cater to uh, homeland security and the intelligence community, but has also had a very negative effect, I think, within traditional institutions. University of Maryland, I believe, is very high on your list. Number one. Uh, number one. Uh, including, you know, many, what is it, 16 or 17 colleges all around the D.C. area that are now essentially feeder schools for the national uh, security state. What has this done to more traditional schools and universities? Well, I think, you know, what we see here is a shift. Uh, I think it would be important to note that the national security state has had a long history with U.S. academia. <laughs> so we need to just acknowledge that. Um, but the shift that's occurring is what we see is essentially the, um, the second and third order effects of that relationship since the Cold War, so that now you have very tight affiliations between um, universities and the national security state, by which I mean the military, the intelligence, homeland security, and law enforcement aspects of the national security state. So, for example, you have um, FBI campus liaisons, schools that are part, administrators that are part of DHS. What does that mean, a liaison? What do they do? Well, what they do is, ostensibly, they're advising schools at how to handle situations like homeland security, terrorist attacks, active shooter situations. But what you also have is um, campus police departments or administration officials who are liaisoning with fusion centers, Joint Terrorism Task Force. You have the um, National Security Higher Education Advisory Board that is a 
consortium of, of university presidents who meets with the FBI. It was founded by the former FBI director, uh, Robert Mueller, and the CIA um, to uh, exchange information and expertise about uh, terrorism, espionage, and the On like. campuses. Yeah, so what we see here is how is it transforming national, I'm sorry, higher education, that's what you asked. These schools are essentially outposts of the national security state. They are so tied into the national security state that the investigation raises deeper questions. What happens to society when the university becomes an outpost of the national security state? What happens when the academy and uh, secondarily the philanthropic community fails to establish a scholarship program within these institutions to uh, cultivate uh, the next generation or this generation of uh, civilian scholars who can provide a genuinely civilian counter-narrative to the national security state. What happens to academic freedom uh, or the things that are, of course, sort of, uh, at least in theory, considered to be core issues within this important institution in civil society? What happens to these uh, issues like academic freedom when you have a growth of classified research on campus, you have information sharing with law enforcement? Um, how does the training cycle itself that we see established within the military and intelligence uh, communities? So for example, vocational training, uh, uh, learning to how to service computers as opposed to the humanities where you're learning analytical critical thinking skills or history or knowledge of the world generally. What happens to uh, citizens uh, when they are not able to develop these skills or the intelligence community? Well, you also, these universities, once they create these programs, become ruled by the dictates of internal security. So, uh, for instance, if you are having a discussion on campus about something that was revealed by WikiLeaks or released by Chelsea Manning, whose trial you so valiantly and effectively covered, um, it, it acts as a form of internal censorship on the campus, doesn't it? Absolutely. I mean, we see this phenomenon manifested recently with Bart Gelman at Purdue. Bart Purdue, Gelman being uh, the Washington Post reporter who had uh, been part of uh, the Snowden revelations, right? You know, Purdue has a NSA center of academic excellence there. This is a center established in order to cultivate uh, future workers in the, uh, you know, cybersecurity information assurance realm. Um, and here you have a Washington Post reporter who covered the Snowden leaks uh, closely and one, was one of Snowden's confidants um, who presents a, is invited to present his talk on these issues and has three classified slides that have been widely distributed amongst the public uh, realm. Um, and because of these national security relationships that Purdue has, um, they have to delete the video of the event. They have to, you know, according to his account, uh, even delete the projector that he used to show these slides because of its uh, relationship with um, uh, uh, the national security state and the production of classified information. But, you know, I want to tell you one other thing that I, I, I thought was equally questionable to me. You know, the FBI active shooter situations have increased. Uh, in the last uh, 10 years. They're exponentially increasing. And, you know, I read a, um, um, an essay by an FBI agent who um, essentially described um, the establishment of threat assessment teams on campus as a means to mitigate uh, the possible risk from an active shooter or an unbalanced student. And one of the paragraphs in this essay actually suggested that if a professor um, saw a picture, a drawing or an essay that disturbed them by a student about violence or the like, that they actually bring it privately to this threat assessment team, which is filled with psychologists and law enforcement personnel, to evaluate whether or not this person is a threat to the campus. I found that paragraph to be highly uh, questionable in light of what 
you know, we think about the university in terms of freedom of expression and the like. What do you think is this means for dissenting groups on campus, students for justice in Palestine, people who oppose the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, those who support the courage of a Chelsea Manning or an Edward Snowden or a Jeremy Hammond or a Julian Assange. Um, that's got to have repercussions. I think so. I mean, and this is where I don't think that the, the, the repercussions are ones that we have not already experienced during the McCarthy era. I mean, there were FBI campus liaisons back then. Mm -hmm. The issue of curricula, though, you know, is also seen in like how anthropology in the 60s and 70s was used for um, national security ends, like studies on Russian emigres and the like. Um, so there has always been this uh, relationship between uh, the intelligence community. The question here is, and it's not as if, let me just say this too, it's not as if the humanities have never been used for foreign policy or national security purposes. I mean, during the Cold War, you had cultural exchanges and the like that have been publicly documented and well known. I think here, the question is, is when you have uh, information technology itself penetrating every aspect of civil society. So we're not just talking about kinetic weapons or segments of society that are segregated from everything else. We're really talking about the uh, notions of freedom of thought, privacy. Uh, when you see that kind of network being uh, um, established within every institution of society, including the university, when you see the university becoming so much a part of the global corporate markets um, and its relationship to the funding uh, and incentives that the national security state provides for it spread through so deeply, um, it starts to begin to uh, raise, I think, very deep and important questions about where we're at and where we're heading. Well, we've seen accompanying this a withering away of the liberal arts and the humanities, uh, especially in you know many state schools where whole departments, philosophy departments, language departments, University of Albany and others, have just been abolished. And the university shifting increasingly, even the elite universities like Stanford and Harvard, to essentially vocational centers of some form. and. That's very dangerous because the death of the liberal arts, the death of the humanities is uh, stripping people of the ability to step into other cultures, to challenge assumptions, to question structures. And, 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 and like business schools, we have now seen, and I think your study, the study you and Bill did has, has uh, provided evidence of this, we are seeing schools become almost exclusively or, or certainly predominantly institutions that create systems managers, whether that's directly for corporate power or for the arm of control that corporate power uses, which is the national security state. Uh, and all of those disciplines uh, that don't serve those vocational needs being shunted aside or in some cases eradicated. And certainly with these online schools, they're not offering it's liberal not, arts. It's not just the online schools. I mean, what you first said and, and, and ended with is really actually something that also surprised us. You know, we saw no nationally ranked uh, liberal arts colleges, you know, the Kenyans or the Amhersts on our list in the top secret world or their academic programs. Secondly, we saw, okay, we saw three Ivy League schools. So we were like, well, why are these here? And we discovered that in the intelligence community, n very few people have bachelors from, from Harvard, you know, where they went to get a, you know, a sort of traditional humanities, liberal arts education. These are middle level managers of the national security state who are going to the Kennedy School of Government, for example, to get credentialing for career advancement. And Cornell and Penn State have specialized graduate school programs. Northwestern, why is it on our list? Well, they happen to educate special agents and mid-level and high-level executives in the FBI for the same thing. So it's really about even the elite schools becoming essentially requisite 
certification for career advancement. And I think that's probably, this is my hypothesis, that's probably more a phenomenon of a networked transient population where you have very many weak social ties and the national security state isn't, isn't larger than it was during World War II, but it's different in that it's networked and it's built together with, you know, sort of black box architecture. And so you need that credentialing because of the market and the nature and the culture and ethos of this community. When you walk away after months of looking at this, what does it say about us as a society? What, you know, what are the kind of, you know, broad ramifications of all this? Well, I think it's, it's, it's dangerous. And the fact that there are so few people covering this, that's also a concern for me. Um, and it, you know, it's one of the great um, privileges to work with someone like Bill Arkin, who's been doing this for 40 years. You know, I think personally, you know, in my own sort of um, vocation and avocation, that if we do not produce a cadre of civilian experts that can offer a counter narrative to this, um, I think we're doomed even more. But in many ways, these people don't even, there is no narrative. All they do is serve the system itself in terms of data collections, electronic surveillance, drone operations, you know, TSA operations. Uh, I'm not even, I wonder if they even have a narrative. I, I don't think they're even educated to, to particularly have a narrative. I think you're right. You know, part of the reason why we don't have the service colleges on this list, even though they fell within the top secret rankings, is because, you know, they are set up and they're owned by the government. They are supposed to be teaching the military arts. And when you teach people the military arts, uh, you tend to also uh, teach them about the ethics of warfare. So there is a sort of a full, sort of comprehensive approach to the skills that they're learning, although those are shifting towards information as well. Um, here, you know, what we have found uh, this investigation raises is that you have a, a large community of America's higher education uh, catalyzing warfare reaping the benefits of warfare. And they aren't really interrogating their own, the own ethical aspects of these phenomena. Uh, you know, intelligence in and of itself is not a bad thing. Foreknowledge before taking action, seeing the results of one's actions in hindsight. These are important skills. Whether or not this is what these schools are teaching, you know, is, is, is questionable. Um, but once again, you know, if you go to the NSA, for example, and say to an engineer, I want you to build a bomb that uh, blows up cats, um, they'll go and build that bomb. Whether or not it's a good or bad idea is the second thing. And I think that it's affecting our debate about the kinds of leaks that you've seen in the last five years. I mean, we can talk about classified material, we can talk about revealing secrets. If we don't understand the material, if we can't diagnose the nature of the landscape, then how are we ever going to find uh, whether or not we value it or consider it to be um, uh, uh, something that we should do away with? We can't. We're just talking about capacity. So these schools are incentivized and they reap the benefits of warfare and the current intelligence collection regime, um, but they aren't really thinking at all. Well, and they're creating a class of people who are never even capable of asking the questions. Uh, and that's what all totalitarian societies seek to create, are people who blindly serve a system and are never, you know, in some sense, at least on a deep level, ever educated. You said something before that really struck home for me. It's something that I have come to understand over the last 20 years of my life. I think it's always easy to say, those people do covert activity, and therefore they're evil. Or those people are part of the national security state. And I think for me, when I see the kinds of work that I do and that I'm interested in is really seeing clearly what is the national security state. It's you and I. It's these institutions. You know, we are so much a part of it, and we can't separate ourselves from it. And I think that in order to really come to terms with it, we have to approach it that way. You know, when I hear people talk about, like, oh, I don't respect soldiers, or, you know, I would never join the military, I say, well, you're lucky you don't have to join the military, because a lot of people join the military in order to get these benefits. Right. And are these people who join the military in order to 
uh, attain social upward uh, mobility and um, to gain uh, capital and, and capacity in their lives, are they being uh, treated in the way that they deserve to be treated? Are they getting the education that they deserve from their GI benefits? Or are they being exploited by companies who are selling them essentially something completely valueless? So these are important questions. And, you know, we really struggled to make sure that we stayed completely empirical in this and that we, um, that we didn't go too far beyond, you know, uh, and, or make just provocative statements just to make them. Mm. Uh, not that provocative statements aren't warranted or not that this isn't uh, concerning or, uh, we're, you know, or that the, what we discovered disturbed us to some degree um, in, in some respects, you know, but really it's about diagnosing the landscape so that we can begin to articulate the value and the ethical components of it. And you've done a great job. Thank you. Thank you, Alexa. And thank you for watching Days of Revolt. Had to eat out the watermelon patch And you know they put me in a shack